I just wanted to say good evening and thank you all for coming to this lecture, which is our first, as mentioned, of the 2018 free lecture series that we offer here. My name is Catherine M. Walter, and I have had the privilege, honor, and joy of being the curator here for the last 15 years. Tonight, I'll be referencing and quoting sources that came from many different research areas, which I'd be happy to share with anyone afterwards. Working with the artifact collection of the Livingston Masonic Library is a journey through history. Each artifact held within the collection reflects a point in time, and each holds a story. Like any story, there's a long version and a short version, and tonight's story can certainly be told in a few words. But it is in the long versions of stories that we see the details which resonate in our own life experience, which make an artifact meaningful, and which take you back to that point in time. I was so honored to give an earlier version of this lecture at an annual Civil War related event held at the Museum Village in Monroe, New York this past September. I was invited to do so by Cornerstone Lodge number 711, Cornerstone Historical Society, and the Museum Village. When I thought about what to bring to the event, and I could only bring one thing, <laughs> One item, which I hadn't seen in a while, jumped to mind. An extraordinary set of resolutions with elaborate hand-drawn fonts, a scene drawn at the top, and four portrait photographs. The resolutions were sent in 1881 from three New York Masons, veterans of the Civil War, to a Confederate Masonic brother from Virginia who had saved them after the Battle of Bull Run the Second Battle of Bull Run. Shortly after starting at the Livingston Masonic Library in 2003, I placed this piece on exhibit, amazed by the story. But at that time, I wasn't able to research it. For the exhibit, I made a sign and told the story in a few words. But I knew there was so much more to learn. It is an important piece with an important story which had been lost to time. I looked for the artifact storage location and it came up in two places in my database. A mistake. I went into the storeroom to find the piece and ascertain the collect correct location. As it turns out, there was no mistake. The Livingston Masonic Library has two copies of it, one framed and one unframed. And because of that, each is stored in a different location and fashion. I looked at both closely and yes, they were exactly the same. Two photographic copies of an original piece. I considered choosing another artifact for the talk, thinking perhaps this wouldn't be a unique enough item upon which to lecture. If there were two in our collection alone, there must have been more. But still, these were four brother masons, and they lived one of those legendary events which illustrate how the bonds of the fraternity are stronger than the strife which can divide men. When you look at the piece, it's hard to tell that some of these lines are actually writing. We think we have fonts. There are 24 alternating fonts in this one document. It reads as follows. At a reunion of Captain Robert A. Dimmick, Captain Thomas D. Moscroft, and Corporal Edward A. Dubay, late of the 10th Regiment, New York Volunteers, held at Brooklyn, New York, on the 30th day of August, 1881, the following minute was adopted, and Corporal Dubay requested to see that the same be suitably engrossed, framed, and forwarded to Captain Hugh Barr, late of the 5th Regiment of Virginia Riflemen, Confederate States of America. On the third day, 30th day of August, 1862, during the Battle of Manassas, Second Bull Run, the above-named Captain Robert A. Dimmick, Captain Thomas D. Moscroft, and Corporal Edward A. Dubay were each severely wounded and left upon the field until the evening of the second day after the battle, their wounds receiving only such attention as each could give the others. And it was becoming painfully evident that unless relief came, and that quickly, death must ensue. Now be it remembered that Brother Hugh Barr, passing in our vicinity while attending to his, his wounded comrades, recognized in us brothers in distress by means of a Masonic emblem on the shirt of Captain Moscroft. Show this to people. 
Brother Barr immediately rendered all the assistance in his power and procured the services of Surgeon Jackson, who extracted the bullets from our persons and carefully dressed our wounds. On the following morning, Brother Barr came with an ambulance and removed us to the Van Pelt House Hospital, from which place we were paroled September 7, 1862, and sent to a hospital in Washington, D.C. Now, therefore, in recognition and remembrance of the brotherly love and humanity <coughs> of Brother Hugh Barr, as exemplified on this, to us, trying occasion, we tender to him this testimonial, not for its intrinsic value, but as a token of brotherly love and esteem, and as an assurance of our heartiest wishes for his future welfare and happiness. Fraternally, Robert A. Dimmick, Thomas D. Moscroft, and Edward A. Dubay. All of that is written on this piece here. The language is as beautiful as both the calligrapher's transcription and the incident it describes. My first reference sources on researching any name related to a Civil War artifact is found in the Livingston Masonic Library's book collection. This first is a title which takes up five shelves and fills 72 books. It's called The War of the Rebellion, a compilation of the official records of the Union and Confederate Armies prepared under the direction of the Secretary of War by Lieutenant Colonel Robert M. Scott, third U.S. Artillery, and published pursuant to an act of Congress approved June 16, 1880. Even the title is long. But we have it, and many other books about the Civil War, on our shelves for a reason. The Livingston Masonic Library has excellent original source archives, artifacts, and books, not only about New York State <coughs> Masonic and general history, but also about the Masonic and general history of the United States and of the world. Over the past 154 years, the library's collections have grown, interwoven, one with the other, with archives and books in the collection that inform and support the artifacts, and artifacts in the collection to illuminate two-dimensional accounts. With the official records of the War of the Rebellion, the final book is an index for all the others. Obviously, well used over the years. <laughs> and it is there where I search first for names, usually with only faint hope of a match. I search for brothers Dimmick, Moscrop, and Dubay. And to my surprise, the first two were there in a battlefield report. The three had been in the battle of the second Bull Run, or second Manassas. This turning point battle was held on August 30th, 1862. It was a major victory for the South, with General Robert E. Lee, who is sometimes referred to as a Mason, but for whom evidence of membership is lacking, against a much larger Northern force, led by General John Pope and General George B. McClellan, who was a Masonic brother, raised in 1853, Willamette Lodge No. 2 in Portland, Oregon. In this battle, Union General Governor K. Warren's 3rd Brigade, a part of General George Sykes' division of the 5th Army Corps, battled Confederate Major General James Longstreet's command. The 3rd Brigade was composed of Captain Winslow's 5th New York Volunteer Infantry, known as Dory's Zouaves, and Colonel W. W. McChesney's 10th New York Volunteer Infantry, known as the National Guard Zouaves or the McChesney Zouaves. I'll speak later about the Zouaves. The report in the official records was from Colonel Governor K. Warren. The whole report is printed out here and reads in part, Sir, I take leave to present herewith a sketch of the field of action of the 30th of August with an account of what I witnessed and the part sustained by my brigade consisting of the 5th New York Volunteers, about 490 strong, and the 10th New York Volunteers, about 510 strong. I knew the enemy was in the woods, but as soon as General and brother Daniel Butterfield's brigade advanced up the hill, there was a great commotion among the rebel forces, and the whole side of the hill and edges of the woods swarmed with men before unseen. It became evident to me that without heavy reinforcements, 
General Butterfield's troops must fall back or be slaughtered. General Daniel Butterfield was raised in 1854 in Metropolitan Lodge number 273, New York. He was also the composer of Taps within the same year of this battle. After making a most desperate and hopeless fight, General Butterfield's fel troops fell back. The enemy advanced with rapidity. The 10th New York fell back on the position held by the 5th New York in such a manner as to completely prevent the 5th from firing. The enemy, in force, opened fire from the woods on the 5th with most fearful effect. I gave the order to march down the hill. Captain Boyd, near me, was wounded, trying to execute it. Adjutant Sovereign carried the order along the line to Captain Winslow, but was killed in the act. Captain Winslow's horse was shot. Captain Lewis, acting field officer, was killed. Captain Huger was killed. Captains McConnell and Montgomery and Lieutenants Raymond, Hoffman, Kaiser, and Wright were wounded. Both color bearers were shot down, and all but four of the sergeants were killed or wounded. Before the colors and the remnant of the regiment could be extricated, 298 men of the 5th New York and 133 of the 10th New York were killed or wounded. In the 10th New York, Lieutenant Hedden was killed, and Captain Dimmick, Lieutenant Dewey, Lieutenant Moscroft, and Lieutenant Culhane wounded. The colors of both regiments were brought off, and the batteries we were protecting were withdrawn. We assisted from the field 77 wounded of the 5th and 8 of the 10th. The remainder fell into the hands of the enemy. Among those were Captains Boyd, McConnell, and Montgomery, and Lieutenants Wright and Raymond of the 5th, and Captain Dimmick, Lieutenants Moscrop and Dewey of the 10th. Braver men than those who fought and fell that day could not be found. It was impossible for us to do more, and as is well known, all the efforts of our army barely checked this advance. Very respectfully, yours, your obedient servant, G.K. Warren, Colonel 5th New York Volunteers, commanding 3rd Brigade. An account of the battle by Union soldier Christian Neuber of Company F stated, and then what was left of the regiment broke and ran for their lives, the rebels after us yelling like fiends, every man for himself what was left of us. They ran for Young's Branch, a nearby stream. Sergeant Thomas Albergati of the Hampton Legion said Young's Branch was just full of dead and dying Yankee soldiers. It was pitiful to hear the poor devils crying from pain and drowning, some mortally wounded and unable to get out. Terrible, terrible to be placed in this predicament. Fourth Texas fighter L.D. Hill said, I never saw more dead men on the same space of ground on any battlefield of the war. The account of Captain Moscroft, here in the middle, was relayed by him as follows. At this awful moment, when the air was full of bursting shells, a destructive fire in our front and upon both flanks, I saw General Warren put spurs to his iron gray horse seize the colors of the 5th Regiment and give the order to retreat to the woods. Break and run like sheep, he said. There is not an order laid down in the books, but it was delivered emphatically and obeyed instantly, and down that hill towards the creek at the foot streamed the remains of those two gallant regiments. Between that fringe of forest and this Virginia ditch lay more than 400 men of the 5th and 10th New York dead, dying, or wounded. Who shall attempt to depict the various and conflicting emotions that agitated the breasts of the survivors as they sped down that disastrous hillside? I cannot. I can hardly find words in which to express my own. There was but one thought that troubled me. How should I get across that miserable Virginia ditch? You see my difficulty, don't you? At each zip, 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 will I ever reach the stream? Ping, 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 can I jump it? Bang, and a sound as if 10,000 window panes were breaking over my head. Ah, there it is. Hi, hi, hi from behind, and I clear it with a bound. As I recover from the impetus of the spring, a tall form tumbles across my path. And as I look, I recognize Captain Dimmick of Company D, here closest to me, shot through both legs. 
I stoop to raise and help him along. When I feel a terrible pain in my left side, I relax and ho my hold and fall helpless by his side. With a quiver of his lips, the captain says, Tom, I'm sorry you stopped to help me, for you might have got off safe. And I replied, it's all right, Bob. I might have been killed at the next step. Not 10 feet away lay Corporal Dubay with three bullets in his limbs. Color Corporal Edward A. Dubay had been badly wounded about 200 feet from Brung's, Young's Branch, the little stream of water running through the field. <coughs> After the brigade had fallen back, Dubay was endeavoring to crawl to the run when a mounted rebel call, called upon him to lay down. He refused, and the merciless horseman, as he went by, shot him in the arm with his revolver. Still, as his canteen was empty, Dubay crawled on one arm and one leg to the stream and managed to reach the opposite side of the run where Captain Dimmick and Lieutenant Moscroft were lying disabled. Moscroft was wounded in the breast and Dimmick had wounds in both thighs. All that night, these three boys of the 10th lay on the battlefield suffering untold agonies from their wounds, unable even to reach the stream of muddy water which lay almost at their feet. Added to the horror was the sight and sound of the dead and dying around them. Some of the mortally wounded were crying for loved ones at home as breath left their bodies. Others in delirium were beseeching someone to bring them water. The situation of the Brooklyn boys was little better for they were unable to stop the flow of blood from their own wounds. Also, the morning dawned hot and sultry. Their sufferings were augmented tenfold. During all of that day under the broiling sun and still another night and until the close of the following day, they lay there waiting and praying for death. But no such fate was in store for them. As the sun was setting, along rode a Confederate officer with the shoulder straps of a captain. He saw glittering on the shirt of Captain Moscroft a little emblem which all Masons know and recognize as the insignia of their order. In a twinkling, the rebel officer was dismounted from his horse and at Captain Moscroft's side. The latter had sufficient strength remaining to make sure that the rebel, that he was in truth a Mason, as were both of his companions. Captain Barr, for this was the name of the Good Samaritan rebel friend, at the time attached to Stonewall Jackson's command, devoted himself to bandaging their wounds as best he could. He distributed the contents of his haversack among them and gave them his name and address with an invitation to call on him at Winchester, Virginia, if all hands got out of the conflict alive. He promised to have the trio removed as soon as possible to a hospital and departed. The rebel friend was as good as his word. On the following day, Captain Barr returned in person with an ambulance and removed his brother Masons to Van Pelt Hospital which was already full. However, provision was made for the Union men to be made comfortable in a tent outside. Mosscrop, Dubay, and Dimmick were paroled the next day and sent to Washington to recuperate. On that bloody day of battle, the 5th New York Volunteers lost 120 members within the first seven minutes of the battle. <coughs> Out of the 10th, brothers Mosscrop, Dimmick, and Dewey were captured. Two other Masonic brothers of the 10th, Brother Private James Smith, Company H, and Brother Private John Taylor McHale, Company A, were killed instantly or died of wounds. They had been raised in the 10th New York Volunteers Military Lodge, called the National Zouave Lodge Under Dispensation. This is the warrant for that lodge. Now the 5th New York Volunteers and the 10th New York Volunteers were not regular soldiers, as evidenced by the nicknames Dury Zouaves and McChesney Zouaves, which was formerly known as National Zouaves. Zouaves were soldiers known as the first and the bravest. Zouave soldiers began with the 1830 French capture of the city of Algiers in North Africa. Local tribesmen of the Zouaoua tribe gave their services to the occupying army and were welcomed. Renowned for bravery and battle-proven techniques, their ranks quickly swelled with French soldiers. The battalions developed an esprit de corps during the mostly guerrilla warfare in Algeria, which set them apart. 
their spirit helped along by a distinctive uniform, daring acts of bravery, and a level of freedom not afforded the regular troops. The uniform was important in the building of the reputation of the legendary Zouaves. Instead of tight, high-colored coats with confining cross belts, as were the uniforms worn by the regular soldiers of the time, the Zouaves wore a fez, a turban, loose baggy red trousers, a blue sleeveless vest, and an open dark blue jacket, which had full trim of red tape. During the Crimean War in 1854 and the Italian War with Austria in 1859, the Zouav soldiers became known on the world stage, and their units won many honors. American newspapers covered their actions, especially the widely circulated Harper's Weekly, which ran illustrations of the French Zouaves. So, long before the Civil War, Zouaves were well known and were reported upon by Captain and brother George B. McClellan during the Crimean War as selected for their fine physique and tried courage, and that they had proven that they were what their appearance would indicate, the most reckless, self-reliant, and complete infantry that U Europe can produce. With his grateful, graceful dress, soldierly bearing, and vigilant attitude, the Zouave at an outpost is the beau ideal of a soldier. In America, while there were Zouave units already in existence, the first famous Zouave unit was formed in 1859 by Elmer E. Ellsworth. He trained a company of the 60th Regiment, Illinois State Militia, and they traveled from September of 1859 until August of 1860, holding exhibitions of gymnastic drill competitions and military exercises. Ellsworth inspired dozens of other Zouave companies, and when the Civil War broke out in 1861, many volunteer Zouave regiments were raised. Ellsworth put together a Zouave regiment from firemen of the New York City Fire Department, the 11th New York Fire Zouaves. They took part in one of the first battles on May 24, 1861, in Alexandria, Virginia. During this battle, Ellsworth was killed while taking down a Confederate flag an act elevated to symbolic meaning and rallying cry on both sides. But his promotion of the Zouave style of soldier had taken root, root. Now, with the remarkable and relatively unknown nature of this library's collections, while rehousing documents last month, I came across this letter. Which was written by E.E. E. Ellsworth. Unfortunately, too zealously mounted a long time ago by someone eager to show the signature of this famous soldier. When I first saw it years ago, I bemoaned the mounting and gave it its own folder, but I didn't know who he was, and I hadn't had time to research. When I came across again, it again last month, I had learned about him for this lecture, and I was amazed that we have this letter. The first and the bravest. In April and May of 1861, in New York City, four complete Zouave units were raised and outfitted, two of them being the 5th New York Volunteers, Dure Zouaves, and the 10th New York Volunteers, National Zouaves. Led initially by Co Colonel Waters W. McChesney, the 10th were known for agility. As a rule, they were small in stature, yet lithe and active, and handled guns and knapsacks with an elastic vigor which often put to blush regiments of six-footers. When the 10th New York was formed in April of 1861, it held 10 companies. In Company B, Robert A. Dimmick, he's the closest here, <coughs> mustered in at 29 years old as, lieutenant, as first lieutenant on April 26, 1861. On the same day, in Company F, Thomas Derbyshire Mosscroft mustered in at 22 years old as second lieutenant. Also in Company F was Edward A. Dubay, mustering in at 22 years old as a corporal. While at Sandy Hook, in May of 1861, a number of Master Masons, who were members of the regiment, met at the quarters of Brother John W. Marshall to discuss the subject of forming a lodge within the camp limits. Brother Herman Cantor brought a petition to Most Worshipful John W. Simons, Grand Master in 1860. It was signed by 12 Masons and recommended by three sitting New York Lodge Masters and one Past Master. 
The petition requested dispensation to form a lodge in the camp of the 10th Regiment New York State Volunteers to be named National Zouave Lodge. One of those 12 petitioners was Brother Robert A. Dimmick. Here is that petition, and here is Brother Dimmick's signature. The dispensation was granted by Most Worshipful Finlay M. King, Grand Master in 1861, for June 1861 until May 25, 1862. The dispensation was extended by the next Grand Master, Most Worshipful John J. Crane, Grand Master in 1862, for one year until May 25, 1863. Remarkably, in the collections of the Livingston Masonic Library is held the return of the 10th New York Volunteers National Zouave Lodge under dispensation. There are also lodge returns from several other Civil War military lodges. The regiment went from Sandy Hook to serve garrison duty at Fort Monroe in the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. During that time, they were there in March of 1862, and they witnessed the famous two-day battle of the two ironclad boats, the Union's Monitor and the Confederate's Merrimack, during which the Confederates were attempting to break the blockade of Norfolk and, Ri and Richmond. The blockade held. By the way, on display in the case in the timeline exhibit outside in the hallway is a gavel made from the wood of the Merrimack. While in Fort Monroe, the lodge met twice a month. During these meetings, 32 members of the regiment were entered, passed, and raised. One of those men was Thomas D. Mosscroft. In this April 21, 1862 letter to the Grand Secretary James Austin, Captain Winchester, Master of National Zouave Lodge under dispensation, states, We have a very fine lodge in many respects. We have not as good facilities in the matter of room, furniture, etc., as we would like, but we have good members, a good attendance, and perfect harmony, the real essentials of a good lodge. We have the advantage of knowing all our members before initiation. Our regiment has been organized for a year, and we have had an excellent chance afforded us to be thoroughly acquainted with the character of all of our candidates for initiation. <coughs> now, for much of the following information about the Northern Brothers, I am indebted to Right Worshipful Gary Heinmiller of Liverpool Syracuse Lodge Number 501 and Seneca River Lodge Number 160, both of Liverpool, New York for the compilation of data he sent me about the three Brooklyn brothers. For much of the information about Captain Barr from the South, I am grateful to Brother Vance Wilson of Moorfield Lodge No. 29, Moorfield, West Virginia. I also thank Marie Barnett, librarian at the Grand Lodge of Virginia, and Ginger Miller, administrative assistant at the Grand Lodge of West Virginia, for their help in tracking down the details of this story. Brother Edward A. Dubay in the center, uh, at the end, sorry, was born in Albany, New York in 1839. His father, a Frenchman who fought for the French army under Napoleon before emigrating to America. The family moved to Brooklyn, where Edward grew, studied, was a great baseball player, and became a sign and banner painter. When the Civil War started, Edward's father enlisted in the 67th New York Volunteers and Edward enlisted in the 10th New York National Zouaves. He was proposed into the National Zouaves Lodge under dispensation in 1861, but the regiment went to the front before he could have the degrees conferred. After the Seven Days Battles near R Richmond, Virginia, June 25th to July 1st, 1862, under Brother McClellan, he was awarded Color Corporal, one of the most dangerous spots in a regiment, given usually to the bravest of soldiers because it's the color corporal who stands with the flag. And amidst all of the smoke, you can see the flag. So people would aim at that. When wounded at the Second Battle of Bull Run, he spent seven months in the hospital to recover from the shots to his arm and leg. And then he returned to Brooklyn. Once home, he became very involved in many groups, including the Central Congregational Church, Crystal Wave Lodge, number 638, FNAM, Gate of the Temple Chapter, 
National Provident Union, Independent Order of Foresters, Union Veteran Legion, Society of the Army of the Potomac, Ex-Prisoners of War Association of New York, Masonic Veteran Association, Society of Old Brooklynites, Gilbert Dramatic Society, <laughs> and the Lincoln Club. <laughs> He was also one of the most active members of the Grand Army of the Republic, or GAR, an association founded in 1866 to maintain the camaraderie developed in battle. In it, he was a member of Winchester Post No. 197, named after his old captain. Most notably, he inaugurated in New York the Bureau of Employment and Relief of the Grand Army of the Republic, a format which was copied in most Union states. Curiously, it shows in the February 13th to May 15th, 1867 return of Crystal Wave Lodge number 638 in Brooklyn, which we have here, that on May 11th of 1867, he was initiated in the first degree. He is listed as 27 years old, a painter, born in New York and residing in Brooklyn. In the subsequent return of May 1st, 1867 to May 1st, 1868, he is listed with the date of his initiation crossed out and with no dates in the past and raised columns. But there is no doubt that he was raised, either during the war or afterwards, as in 1868, he became a Royal Arch Mason. In 1897, he joined both Kismet Temple of the Ancient Arabic Order Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, or Shriners, and was also knighted in Clinton Commandery No. 14. In 1899, he was elected Vice Commander of the Commandery by a larger vote than any other candidate had ever received. And he was the first to deliver a report of the work. Edward Dubay was also an inventor with over 11 patents to his, for his creations. He met with a tragic end, however, being murdered at 82 years old on May 27, 1921, by a blow to the head from another sign painter. And that's a story we're probably never going to know the reason for. <laughs> of the three northern soldiers, I found the least information about Brother Robert A. Dimmick. He's in the closest here. He was born on, April, he was born on February 18, 1832, and became a prominent pension attorney. He married Rebecca A. McLaughlin, and they had three girls. Before the war, he was raised in Hudson Lodge No. 7, but the record is also a bit odd in the returns. In the 1856-57 return, he is listed as Robert Allen Dimmick, 25 years old, occupation clerk, born in Hudson, New York, residing in Hudson, New York. He was initiated, passed, and raised in the spring of 1857. In the very next return of 1857-58, he is listed with the same Grand Lodge number and the same Lodge number as Robert A. Dimmick, no age listed, occupation commission business, born in Athens, no age, uh, and residing in New York, and was initiated and passed in the winter of 1858 and raised in the spring of 1858. In the National Zouave's UD return, he is listed as Robert A. Dimmick, a soldier, born in New York, residing in New York, who affiliated with the Zouave's Lodge on June 11, 1861. The return does note that he was previously a member from Hudson Lodge No. 7. After the war, Robert A. Dimmick became a member of Hiawatha Lodge No. 434 in Mount Vernon, New York, and is listed as joining the Lodge on the return of May 1, 1866 to May 1, 1867. He was 34 years old, a clerk, born in Hudson, New York, and residing in Mount Vernon, New York. Robert was also active in the Grand Army of the Republic. Robert, Brother Dimmick was buried at Arlington National Cemetery in 1902, after dying at the State Soldiers' Home in Bath, New York. In his obituary, it is stated that he was at one time a prominent pension attorney in Washington, D.C., and that he was a member of Georgia Post No. 1, GAR. Brother Thomas D. Moscroft, in the middle, was born in Derbyshire of England. His family moved, it, he was born on March 4th, 1839. His family moved to New York when he was three. His father opened three shops in Brooklyn in succession before opening an oyster and chop shop, rest, an oyster and chop restaurant. Thomas was one of seven children 
and at age 12 left school to work with his father. At 18, he joined the New York Militia and was elected president of the, union's, the unit's civic organization. In 1861, after the attack on Fort Sumter, he opened a recruiting office to raise a Zouave regiment. In two days, he had 300 volunteers ready to follow him, but he insisted his friend Salmon B. P. Winchester be made captain, he who later served as the National Zouave Lodge UD Master. Brother Mosscroft was raised and was listed in the return of the National Zouave Lodge UD as being 24, a soldier, born in Connecticut and residing in Brooklyn. And later you can come and see his name actually right up in there. His initiation fee was $15 and his quarterly dues were $1.25. In August of 1862, at the Second Battle of Bull Run, he was shot through the left lung. After recovering in October of 1862, he married and with his wife, Emma L. Mitten, had three boys, Alfred, William, and Thomas. All three graduated from Cornell University. In February of 1864, he affiliated with Stella Lodge, number 485, and is listed in the return of December 1863 to May, to May of 1864. I've also seen reference to the possibility that he was a member of Hudson Lodge, number seven, as well. Thomas worked for the United States Tax Department and was instrumental in bringing regulation to the chaotic tax departments before moving to have a practical monopoly on title searching in Brooklyn. In 1894, he began to work at Kings County Register for Granville W. Harmon. I have seen reference but not confirmation that he was a brother as well. This is a name we will hear more about in a moment. Thomas was also active in politics in the Masonic Veterans Association, the Grand Army of the Republic, and numerous other associations. He died on February 22nd, 1912, at the age of 73. So that is what we know so far of the Northern Masonic Brothers in this story. As for the Southern captain who saved him, saved them, Captain Hugh Barr, was born in Winchester, Virginia. On November 1st, 1860, Hugh married Martha Samsell, one of the finest singers in the area. Five months later, on April 18, 1861, Hugh and his brother, Oscar, enlisted together in the 5th Regiment of Virginia Riflemen. Hugh was a skilled musician, and he served as drum major with the famous Stonewall Brigade Band in the 5th Virginian Regiment. After the war, Captain Barr returned to Moorfield, Virginia. He opened a shoe repair shop, and he and Martha had seven sons and two daughters. He joined Moorfield Lodge No. 29, West Virginia, in 1870, serving as Tyler from 1871 to 1873, but by 1882 was unaffiliated. He had closed his shoe shop in 1881, the year he received the resolutions, and he moved to a frosty hollow Virginia mountain farm. Sadly, and most difficult for his wife and his large family, Captain Barr died of pneumonia four years later on February 5th, 1885, at the age of 45. After his death, the three Northern brothers and other members of the 10th New York Volunteers sent to Captain Barr's widow a substantial sum at Christmas, every Christmas, demonstrating the deep gratefulness they had for her late husband's extraordinary actions during the war. The captain's son, Beauregard, was a trained musician who formed a band with his brothers called the Barr Band which for the next 50 years and two generations played at every social gathering around Moorfield and Piedmont, Virginia, and at every local political rally. The whole family were great musicians, playing almost any instrument, and were also great fishermen and hunters. Now that the four men are known more fully than names on a page, imagine again the three Brooklyn Masons lying there bleeding to death amid over 400 others dead and dying. Imagine Captain Barr, drum major and lover of music, coming upon his brothers and saving them. Eighteen years later, in 1880, 
Captain Dimmick went to Winchester to attend a celebration and there found Captain Barr and a glorious time followed. Captain Barr, in the presence of his military friends in the public market house, threw his arms around Captain Dimmick and greeted him as a long lost brother. After the reunion, Captain Dimmick returned with Captain Barr to Moorfield. There, Dimmick was overwhelmed with kindness by Captain Barr, his gentle wife, and friends. The next year, as we remember the first words of the resolutions, at a reunion of Captain Robert A. Dimmick, Captain Thomas A. Mosscrop, and Corporal Edward A. Dubay, on the 30th day of August, 1881, the following minute was adopted, the same to be engrossed, framed, and forwarded to Captain Hugh Barr. Now this artifact is an image of the original. <coughs> the original was described in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle as follows. It consists of sincere expressions of gratitude executed by a superior artist together with photographs of each of the several parties and a battle scene where Captain Barr is represented as administering to the want of his brother Masons of the Union side. The whole is surmounted with an elegant frame of new style, steel and gold and altogether it will no doubt be one of the important contributions to the history of the past that will naturally cement the friendships between the soldier element. Captain Barr, a merchant of Moorfield, West Virginia, is unaware of the presentation to be made of him and will undoubtedly be greatly surprised. The sketch at the scene of the top was historically accurate as verified through the location of the place by John Travascus of Brooklyn, who was detailed to make maps of the field. The painting at the top of the resolutions is attributed to James E. Taylor, an artist who was with the regiment. Here is an image of him in the Zouave uniform of the 10th New York Volunteer National Zouaves. No Masonic affiliation has been yet found for James E. Taylor, but certainly, the research on the various aspects of this story is not complete. There are some odd anomalies, such as the fact that the only record of Captain Barr <coughs> joining the fraternity was in 1870, after the war. Was he a Mason raised in a military lodge? Virginia did not have them, and West Virginia wasn't formed until 1861. Another oddity is seen is that in the records show that Brother Dubay did not take the first degree until after the war although he had been proposed. Perhaps some wartime degrees were done in between battles without a clear record kept, or perhaps the records have been lost. Perhaps they are sitting in an archive somewhere waiting to be found. Certainly, Captain Barr greeted the men as brothers and was received by them as a brother. There is always more to research and discover. When the resolutions were forwarded to Captain Barr, he put them in the window of his store. The Mooresville Gazette reported that the crowd in front of the store was so big that he was asked to, and did, display them in the public square. The following Saturday, all the school children were marched to the square to see the picture and read the resolutions. Now, from the moment I realized what I had was a photograph of the actual set of resolutions sent to Captain Barr, I wondered where the original was. I found reference in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle of 1896 stating, after the death of Captain Barr, his widow sent the original of the resolutions to the Grand Lodge of Masons of Virginia. It now hangs in a place of honor on the walls of that lodge. I asked the libraries of both the Grand Lodge of Virginia and the Grand Lodge of West Virginia, but while they were both very helpful in tracking down Captain Barr's Masonic membership, neither had the original resolutions or any copies of it in their collections. I was put in touch with Brother Vance we Wilson, referenced earlier, <coughs> who just so happens to be the husband of Captain Barr's great-great-granddaughter. He said he had heard of a mural at the house of one of his relatives, which had been given to his ancestor by three northern soldiers, and I thought, a mural? I wouldn't call anything this size a mural. Brother Wilson has promised to try to get me a picture of it. What he did send me confirmed it, though. Within a three-page family history by Mary Riggleman Fry, daughter of Elsie Barr Riggleman, there. The exact description of the resolutions, and yes, the original is big. 
The family historian described the battle and then wrote, later they sent Captain Barr a large plaque about four feet by five feet, which stated the now familiar words on the 30th day of August, 1862, during the Battle of Manassas. It is truly a curator's joy to locate the origin of an artifact and to bring in the data from so many places so that as full a story as possible can be told. However, history, being the interconnected web that it is, shows us that there is, as always, more. A really, really odd coincidence then happened. Out of the blue, while I was in the midst of the research for this artifact, I received an email. Unbelievable. It was from Paul Gallagher of Stillwell House Fine Arts and Antiques in Red Bank, New Jersey. His gallery had recent a recently added to its walls a painting called After the Battle, A Rebel Friend. And the story of how he got it to be told at another time was just as amazing. An accompanying pamphlet indicated the Civil War depicted had connections to three New York Masons, and he was wondering if I knew anything about the scene. <laughs> <laughs> the coincidence was stunning for us both. The accompanying documentation he sent was instrumental in pulling the above, the above story together, and I thank him. Mr. Gallagher believed the painting belonged in a museum and wondered if the library was interested in purchasing the painting. Well, I was very interested, adding artifacts to the museum collection at this time is by donation only. A loss for us, but the painting quickly found a wonderful home with Mr. George Turek, a gallery owner of the 19th and 20th century American art. He is also a collector and patron of military art. Mr. Turek is a Vietnam veteran and a Purple Heart recipient, and he is on the advisory council for the National Museum United States Army. On his own property, he has installed numerous exquisite and honorable memorials, memorials to veterans of different wars, a few highlighted here. This is General Sickles, a Civil War general for the North. This flag can be seen from a great distance, and these sculptures were commissioned by George Turek and made by Andrew Chernek to honor the men he was with in Vietnam who never made it home. When you strike the helmet, it makes a bell sound. As the new owner of the Rebel Friend painting, Mr. Turek was graciously willing to lend it to me for the lecture in Monroe, but with the distance, the time frame, and the question of insurance, it was impossible. Paul, Gall Paul Gallagher, the gallery owner, sent me numerous pictures of the painting, a photocopy of a pamphlet titled A Battlefield Story of the Blue and Gray, and a photocopy of one of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle articles of the event. The image in the 1905 newspaper was an image of the painting Mr. Gallagher had shown me. The painting was done in 1885, the year Captain Barr died, by Joseph Sewell. Sewell was an artist born in England and who was also a Civil War veteran, a private in Company D, 14th Kentucky Cavalry. The small sketch on the resolutions by Taylor had been fully and exquisitely realized. In the Brooklyn Daily Eagle of December 1896 is found references to both the oil painting and the copies. As mentioned, Captain Mosscroft's su supervisor in the King's County Register's office in Brooklyn was Granville W. Harmon. In the Eagle, it is stated that, hanging on the wall of Register Granville W. Harmon's private office in the Hall of Records is a picture under which is the title, The Rebel Friend. I just want to make a mention of how rare it is you ever see any mention of an artifact in the newspapers. The story connects the story of the picture connects the name of Mr. Harmon's superintendent, Captain T.D. Moscroft, with one of those touching episodes of the Civil War which served to lessen in a degree some of the horrors of that terrible conflict. Alongside the picture of the rebel friend in Register Harmon's office is another memento of this occasion. It is a photographic copy of an elaborate set of resolutions 
which in 1881 were sent to Captain Barr. Then, in a 1905 article, I saw a truly fantastic second reference to the copies having been made of the resolutions. It stated, in 1904, brothers Dubay and Moscroft wished to make to present to President and brother Theodore Roosevelt a copy of the picture and the resolutions, and they enlisted the help of District Deputy Grandmaster Henry L. Redfield of the then named Second District. Brother Redfield and three other brothers were appointed a committee to make the presentation which was done at Oyster Bay, New York, where Brother Theodore Roosevelt's lodge is. The following is President Roosevelt's letter of acknowledgement. White House, Washington, October 26, 1904. My dear Brother Redfield, I value the gift of the picture greatly, and I'm very much interested in and very much touched by the circumstances con connected with it. I wish it were possible that this story could be sent to every Masonic Lodge in our country. Will you convey to the committee, and especially to brothers Dubay and Moscrop, my cordial thanks for their fraternal cour courtesy, and believe me, faithfully yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Now I understood why we had two copies. Maybe once, 113 years ago, there were copies of these resolutions in every lodge around the state. Maybe most were lost to time, having long since faded away due to continual exposure to light. Perhaps the two remaining copies of the resolutions in the library are the only surviving ones. Or maybe there are still copies hanging in forgotten corners, their loaners or lodge members now able to see them with renewed appreciation. We also know that the original still exists, four feet wide and five feet tall. It is a work of art that must be spectacular to see. A work of art created to commemorate a life-saving hand pulling three brothers from the brink of death and proving that the Masonic tie that binds is one that, that can overcome the most dire of circumstances, a story of true brotherhood that should not be lost to time. Thank you. Wow.